outro cast. Modi, thank you for taking the time. Before I ask about, you know, all of your wonderful projects, how's your day going aside from having to talk to, you know, fake news media? <laughs> this isn't fake news media. This is great. Uh, it's it's the it's the best ways to start the day is a nice podcast, wow. an interview. It gets you going, reminds you what's important, what you're pushing, what you're plugging. Um, and that said, but right away I wake up, I talk about the the, the new comedy special I have out. Know your yeah. audience, and that's how you start the day. Yes, know your audience is the new special. I see that comedians are a little divided about specials. The Jay Leno approach was if I do a special, that's retiring the material, that's wasting money. And then you have the other people like Louis C.K. who were thinking one special a year is what I got to do. What led you to realizing, okay, now it's time to do a special? Uh, well, it, it was a tour that Know Your Audience was a tour I did. And, um, and now it's time to retire. I, it's not retire the material. You know, it's material that you're putting online. It's 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 not my material. It's material that God gave me. I literally believe any good joke I ever got was something opened up in my, in the universe in my head, and I got a good joke. And it's not mine. It's God's, and putting it out there, and people get to see it, and people, you, you know, it, it it leaves your your legacy. George Carlin, when people, when young people hear about it, who's George Carlin, you say Google him look him up and they get to see clips because they don't have the attention span to watch a full session, uh, a, a full, full special. So right. they see clips and see how genius he is. And one day I'll die and this, this, these will live. And that's why it's important to put them out. So going through your bio, I find it very fascinating where you grew up on Long Island. There was no comedy club in that town. You were about eight miles from a comedy club yet there was a bridge separating you or you know it was not easy to get there what was the first long island venue that you played do you remember i you know i never growing up went to a comedy club i never had any intentions of being a comedian i was uh i was an investment banker out of college yes. and then and then i my friends said you should do all these imitations you do for us on stage and that's the first time i went to a comedy club but uh, the first comedy club I ever did in Long Island would probably be um, uh, Governors, I think, was one of those. Yeah, Governors is one of those clubs. Yeah. And Governors years ago, was... since years ago, years ago. Yeah. And you were playing the comedy cellar before it was cool. I, it was always cool, but I was, I was there. I just celebrated my 30th anniversary at the comedy cellar. Uh, in April 1994 was when I was passed. I say before is cool because right now when I think of the comedy cellar, I think of initially the comedians who kind of made it from tough crowd with Colin Quinn. And 1994 was still six, seven years before tough crowd with Colin Quinn. Yeah, but there were still comedians that were uh, that were working and got, Ray Romano, for example, was there and blew up, uh, you know, before colin quinn's show colin quinn's show helped out like me and jim norton and uh, rich voss and uh it, you know it just we, we, there was a venue for us to to be on television and it was an amazing uh it was an amazing amazing show yeah absolutely but we're not here to talk about colin quinn's greatness we're talking about your greatness right yes and besides the special besides always being on the road with stand-up your podcast recently crossed the 100 episode threshold. When you started it, did you see it as a long term thing? Um, I, I, I kind of, I, I'm a stick to a guy. I, I, I said we're going to do it until we figure it out. Uh, we, we, we found two different studios we moved from. We be, I began to find my, my cadence on, uh, on doing a podcast. I, I, we had sponsors, which also always helps. And, um, and then we had the 100th episode, which was on, um, which we taped at the 92nd Street Y which yeah. was amazing. And uh, the best part of the po podcast is when my uh, when my, my husband began to sit in and uh, it gave it a whole other element. And you were talking about, I think on episode 101, you were worried about your suit bunching up or whatever it was on the 100. Don't worry about it. You were fine with all that <laughs> kind of thing. But 92Y is a prestigious institution. How did that one happen? Did it, was it they went, hey, yeah, we love Modi, or was it a begging, pleading that you weren't? No, say 
luckily things were organic that they're fans of mine i'm fans of theirs and it was just a, a no-brainer and they they said uh, use the space let's do it let's collab on this and let's do it together and it was uh it was such an amazing uh in, evening and I, anybody listening to this you should definitely catch that it's the and here's modi podcast available anywhere the 100th episode it's really really great so again uh the podcast the special the touring etc do you then have to do the thing where you go i guess i need to have a book too do you have to have yes that title? <laughs> yes we're working on that as well um uh we just submitted a proposal it's already written out and um it's being sent around and now there's a special to you know that they can see a little more of my my, my flavor and um and uh yeah the book is exciting because it's fun it's it you know i'm doing this book and it's uh it's bringing back all these crazy stories. When you're on the road and a comedian, every comic has his own journey. Mine's like with these fundraisers and with these crazy events and Jewish yeah. things and and the the end of the Catskill era. And so it's a uh, it's a, it's and the stories are hysterical. I, I, stories that I didn't even think were funny, and I'm telling it to the woman I'm writing it with, Perriel Ashton Brown, and sh she's dying. And I'm like, oh, I guess these are funny. <clears throat> Oh, oh, okay. I, I didn't, I didn't know that if there was going to be an end. You caught me off guard there. But <laughs> in terms of you know the Jewish journey of being a stand-up comic, I don't think the average person realizes that there's a legitimate circuit of synagogues. The way that you know more roast-oriented comedians might do VFW halls and that kind of thing, and they're good cash gigs where you're playing to audiences who love you. Were the synagogue gigs a big part of your? upcoming as a comic 100 percent um it synagogues synagogues just saw there was a way when they did their fundraisers instead of someone just writing a check and sending it they see there's going to be a comedian at the dinner they'll come as well and then um and at first you know they were coming because they knew there would be a comic they didn't know they weren't sure who i was then i began to build a name and then they were able to do now i'm filling up uh 1200 seats in a synagogue because they're coming for comedy night with Modi. They're charging them extra and they're sponsors and they're doing all their fundraisers, but it's, I, I'm the draw, which is, I don't know if you're Jewish, but to walk into a synagogue and see 1200 people and it's not Yom Kippur or Rosh Hashanah, you know, <laughs> the high holidays, it's like, it blows your mind away. Yeah, and the average club that you're gonna play is what, 200 people at that point in time at best? Comedy clubs at best, you're you're 500 seats. A theater, yep. you could do 900 seats. Over here, you're in a synagogue doing 1,200 seats, and and you know, and it's and they're and it's and it's and it's a synagogue. They're all Jewish. They're all coming there to it's their 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 house of worship. It's 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 an amazing amazing feeling. When I was a kid, I remember my parents telling me that Judy Gold played their synagogue. Was she on the the comedy circuit with you of the synagogues? She was on that circuit too. She she still is. I still am. I still am. I just did Houston, Texas. I did this massive synagogue there. Nine hundred people. It was amazing. You, you, literally, my agent, my manager, were thinking, "What theater should we do in Houston?" And this synagogue called and said, "Whatever it is, we want to happen in our synagogue." And then they they, did, they made it happen. Lighting this, it's. It was a massive uh, shul, a synagogue. 900 people came. It was amazing. Do you, when you're playing a synagogue, still do the Hatikva closer? Or is that just too on the point and too obvious? Uh, no. Listen, ever since October 7th, I've been singing Hatikva at the end of the show. It's just because, you know, here we are, like, cr cracking up for an hour and a half, laughing hysterically. And there's a war going on. And there's hostages. And there's... Yeah conflict and you just at the end just to remind everybody where our hearts and where our our souls and our prayers are we sing the tick when people have been loving it and i don't i can't see myself ending that in the near future i remember one comedian who may or may not have booked talent at governors and then opened up shows telling me that there was one bit that he stopped doing because it killed too hard he thought it was too easy sometimes that's a weird thing that I hear from comedians. I'm like, oh, that's just too easy. I don't want to get easy laughs. So in your case, I didn't know if you didn't want to get the easy empathy, sympathy thing. You just thought it was too, 
know, it's not, not it, listen it it didn't i didn't do it to, to try to uh to, to, to it's just something that i just we just had an hour and a half of laughter. We need to regroup and think about where where everything really is. And the song itself is so amazing. the The words are whatever it is, but it's it's only a minute. It has a beat that it's in a minor, so everybody can hum along and they sing along. And it's um, it's not the easy empathy. It's literally you see the emotions that people have, and it's just it's it's amazing. It's it's. I, I, it's, I, I, it's not an easy uh, emotional uh, trigger that I'm hitting. It's, if it's, it comes from a real place. I can imagine. Well, three questions and then I'll let you go. The first one is the, I'm speaking to a person who's obviously very motivated because you had a normal job before you made it as a comic and it's been long-term success. My words, not yours, long-term success in your career. But what do you do when you're not working, when you're not doing comedy? Is there a main passion? Uh, I, I'm i always doing comedy. So there's always a show coming up in a day or two. Um, I keep saying by, I, I love to work out with my husband. We go to the gym. Whenever we land somewhere, we find out where the Equinox is or the gym is. And we go, and even if it's just a, an hour on the treadmill or do weights, and we have our, when we're in New York, we have our trainer that we love uh stan and um we do that and then we we try to 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 vacation and to have fun and to go to 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 hear djs in brooklyn and rave a little bit and uh you know there's amazing stuff happening right over the bridge i live in the lower east side crossover williamsburg bridge there's amazing clubs the knockdown center basement there's uh the yeah. mirage and all of these places we go and we dance and let some steam off and have and have a blast next question we called out the long island roots a few times earlier in this conversation here when I was growing up, it was not cool to be from Long Island. You know, you, you'd be embarrassing yourself in front of city people to refer to being from Long Island. Now, every five towns, there's a theater on Long Island, pretty much. There's top restaurants, et cetera. When did you start to notice the tide turn and Long Island not being an embarrassing thing anymore? I never knew it to be an embarrassing thing. The tide turned like... I'm from the five towns. I was, so I grew up there. You have to understand we were like in the eighties um, and it wasn't as religious as it is now. Right now, if you're in the five towns, also Long Beach, you know, it's just synagogues and synagogues and another yeah. synagogue and a yeshiva and a, and the kosher restaurant, this and the kosher shopping mall and the kosher, 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 kosher. And, and it's just, it's insane when I drive home to see my parents. I'm like, I can't believe this. When we were there, there, were like, there was a one young Israel, the, the, the young Israel synagogue, which was the Orthodox, and it wasn't that big. And there were like a whole bunch of conservative synagogues. And now it's just all Orthodox. And it, it works and it's not embarrassing. The homes are beautiful and they're, it's convenient. You are with no traffic, a half hour from Manhattan. You are, it's, I never knew Long Island to be embarrassing. Maybe if you're from Hicksville or Chachamak or Rankankama, Rangangama, whatever that place is. Sure. It's, and, you know, yeah. And then the Hamptons are, you know, the Hamptons is not embarrassed and the Hamptons is the Hamptons. And then you have Bellport blew up. Bellport blew up. All the Brooklyn gays got a place in Bellport. That is the most insane thing you've ever seen. And um, and and it's it's uh, it's it's very choose your own journey, Long Island. You can go to some rich area, or you can find a little home in some cute little neighborhood. Yeah. Before I ask my last question, you know, Long Beach has a random comedy workout room that Colin Quinn's done a few times, and Jim Brewer just in some bar that serves pizza. They put up a stage. Dice Clay is played here, so hopefully we see you eventually at Borelli's Tap in Long Beach and then Baldwin the one of the guys from uh, Wild and Out has a workout room in North Baldwin so maybe again we see you on a weeknight off night on Long Island but the last question and I don't know if this gets a 10 second no or a five second rant here I'm curious if you're aware of how often your name comes up in the dabble verse what's the dabble verse uh, the dabble verse, it's really hard to explain, but basically stuttering John Melendez and Kevin Brennan feuding with a lot of comedians like Shuli Agar and Bob Levy and all that. 
And when John Melendez talks about the comedians that he helped give a start to, he says your name a lot. That's one of the names that comes up. And I didn't know if any of that hit your radar. I guess the answer is no. The answer is no, but John Melendez is, I could definitely say, you, let me tell you something. When you're Jewish, everybody helped your career. Everybody takes the credit. You walk into any gig, into synagogue, fundraiser, yeshiva, fundraiser, it's because of you I'm here. It's, they always say to you, I was the one that told them they should get you. I was the one to everybody. To, and I always say, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. It's, real, it's so sweet of you to, to help me out. Yes. They were looking for a magician. I said they should get Modi. L literally, like they're so out there. But you thank him. John Melendez, John Melendez, I don't know, in this double gag of universe of yours, I opened for Robert Schimmel a uh, hundred years ago at Governor. It may be Governor's. Yeah, I think it was Gov. Oh, wow, it was Governor's. It all goes back to the beginning, to the beginning yeah. of, the, of this interview. And John saw me and I killed. And he and I asked him for a ride home, and he said, "You know what? I'm going to give you a ride home just in case you blow up." We became we became amazing friends, and John was on the Howard Stern show, and he would um, he would take these amazing a rooms for the weekend, Friday, Saturday only, because he had to be on the Stern show. So we did we did to do Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. We just do Friday, Saturday in these top rooms all over America, and he would bring me and Nick DiPaolo, and Jim Florentine, and Jim Norton, and whoever the, 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 the group, whoever was available, and we would do the show. He would MC, and we, would, and we were all over the place. And Howard would, uh, would it got me on Howard Stern. So 100% John Melendez helped me out. He put me into that circuit of the comedy clubs without really having to be drudging, you know, gr grinding the Thursday through Sundays at a Zany's or at a at an improv somewhere. So John's, I love John. I love him. Well, thank you for that answer. Congrats on the special. Congrats on the thank podcast. Thank you. The book, I didn't know about the book. Congrats in advance on the book. Modi, thank you. you're inspiring and I look forward to whatever's coming next. Thank you so much. And I always tell anybody listening to any of these things, be the friend that brings the friends to the comedy show. You see a comic coming to your area, get six, eight tickets. Don't just buy tickets for you and your friend. Get Just buy tickets. By the time the comic is there, everyone's going to want to go. Uh, and that's it. ModiLive.com. Be, say hi. Tell me what you thought of this interview. Love you all. Thank you so much for your time. Outro cast.